All right. Uh, hello, everybody. And uh, I'm Kevin Wang. And today I'm going to talk about flywheel crypto economics. Uh, so just a, a brief introduction. Um, so I'm Kevin, uh, one of the co-founders of, uh, of Nervos Network. And um, also, uh, I'm one of the uh, designers for Nervos crypto economic model. Uh, so just a little bit, one line about Nervos. So Nervos Network is a proof-of-work, uh, multi-asset smart contract platform, right? So, uh, so, in this, oh, so in this sense, it's kind of similar to you know, Ethereum and other platforms, but we are strictly built for store value. So it's a multi-asset store value platform. Now, we'll talk about what that means and then you know, why, why it matters and how we design the crypto economic uh, for Nervos, but today's talk, basically, I want to share uh, some of the takeaways, some of the learning uh, that when we designed the crypto economic model for Nervos. Um, okay, this is not the right slide, so I'm going to skip on this. Uh, so, <laughs> so that was meant to be agenda, but somehow I think they didn't get the updated version. Um, all right, so... Uh, in the beginning, I want to talk about the difference between two types of crypto economics. Um, and uh, I feel like this is um, a very important differentiation. Uh, one is what we call micro crypto economics, right? So this is basically the sort of the economic game or incentives, right? Uh, schemes and punishment you give to participants of a protocol over a short period of time, right? So the example of this is uh, that in layer one, right? So what do you need to design the crypto model so that layer one can achieve um, consensus? Uh, again, you know, this is a, a rather short period, right? And for applications, this is more about, you know, a more transaction-based uh, approach, right? So you want to make sure, you know, service providers and uh, users uh, that are properly compensated and so on. Um, so a very, uh, a very typical example is that, you know, we need to make sure transactions carry transaction fees so that to prevent, um, you know, DDoS attacks. And then you have things like for, uh, you know, POS um, protocols, you need to include things like staking and punish, right? Just to make sure that people behave uh, to the protocol and then can achieve consensus on the layer one. Okay, now this is not the focus of today's conversation. Um, and then the other thing I feel that is understudied and it actually took us a long time to realize there's a different type of crypto economic model. Uh, it's what we call macro crypto economics, right? So now, uh, different from the first type, this focuses on incentive com compatibility of uh, participants over a long period of time, right? So if microcryptonomics to make sure, let's use the layer one example, right? Just easier to understand. Let's say the microcryptonomic model makes sure that layer one achieves consensus. The macroeconomic model makes sure that your token will always have value. Now, why is that important, right? If you don't have this designed correctly, you don't have this, right? So the reason, for example, participants can achieve consensus is because you have something of value as incentives. So if you cannot guarantee what you're trying to incentivize them always have value or necessary value, right, to satisfy your security parameters, then you can't use that to incentivize participants. So macroeconomics, what we believe is make sure your token will always have value. So what are the things that concern uh, a crypto designer when you think about this macroeconomics? It would be things like supply issuance, how you supply your tokens, how your issuance curve go, right? And then what's your token utility? Uh, how do you capture value? And then how does the network grow? And then in, especially in face of competition. The reason this is important is that crypto networks are inherently open networks, right? It basically means your code is probably going to be open source. And then all your uh, state on chain is also visible to everyone. So everybody can just fork you uh, or, or, or you know, airdrop their participants uh, with the token that you have. So there's, not, there's nothing that inherently that's close, right? So, uh, so we have to take into consideration competition as well. Um, 
Okay, so key for long-term competitiveness and sustainability of the protocol is really the field of what we believe macroeconomic cryptoeconomics. And uh, we feel uh, that, because we spend a lot of time here, so we feel it's very understudied, and then there are a lot of design space uh, in, in, in here. Okay, so uh, yeah. Um, so this is just something that's really interesting. I want to bring it out. Um, like, why is it that macroeconomics is important, right? So if you look at Bitcoin, for example, um, there are just many, many forks, uh, clones, or competition, competitors who claim to be a better payment network for Bitcoin protocol as a peer-to-peer -peer payment network. Um, but there's no one, there's virtually no one that challenge and say, hey, we're also, a, I mean, other than us, but we'll get to that a little bit later, but, but there's no, <laughs> right? There's no one else that say, hey, we are actually challenging Bitcoin as a better store of value system, uh, right? So there's no c competition there. So you think about this is quite interesting because Bitcoin basically has two narratives, two storylines. One is about peer-to-peer -peer network, a payment network. One is about store of value network. How is that everybody's trying to take the peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer network, and nobody's challenging for the store value, right? And then we'll get to that, what we believe is the case. Okay, so uh, again, you know, we believe a project basically, you know, uh, thrive or die with their crypto economics. So let's, the hypothesis that we have in the beginning, and then we'll, you know, walk you guys to go through this, is that fundamentally that's because the crypto economics design of the Bitcoin network. Um, so for example, as a payment network, what do users care about, right? So again, the use case of payment network is, okay, I'm gonna send uh, you know, $100,000 to somebody else. Um, that bank wire is gonna be really expensive and slow, so I'm gonna use crypto network, right? So what I'm gonna do is basically take my US dollars and then you know, go to OTC or exchange to get some Bitcoin and then send to the person I wanna receive and then you know, they probably sell their Bitcoins to get back USD. Um, so what do I care about? Well, I care about low transaction cost. I don't want to spend a lot of money here, right? And uh, which involves slippage and fees. And I also care about low volatility. And this is kind of a big deal uh, because I don't want, you know, I don't want to send $100,000 and they like Bitcoin price drop 10% and they receive only 90,000, right? So low volatility is also important. Now, what do I, the thing that I don't care about, security, yeah, it's, right? I don't want to use the network for maybe five minutes. They will receive the fund or stuff like that. So I don't really particularly care about security. Censorship resistance, also not a big deal, right? So, okay, if they censor me, I'm just going to use Ethereum. If Ethereum censor me, I'm going to use something else, right? So there are many choices. So I don't particularly use that as how I'm going to choose the network. Also, token price. I don't really care if Bitcoin is $10 or $10,000, right? For me, it's the same. Um, okay, now... Having this, let's look at Bitcoin's cryptonomic design and see whether they're neutral, positive, or negative um, for, uh, for this use case. So I would say cap supply is neutral, right? Again, as a user, I don't care if I have cap supply or not, right? I just send money. Geometrically decrease the insurance curve, I, I, don't, I don't really care, right? Fixed block rewards when each halving. Again, these are things it doesn't, you know, doesn't matter to me when I just send money, some, some, uh, some, some people some money. Uh, you know, we kind of go through this, minor competition in native currency. So these are choices that Bitcoin uh, uh, chose uh, as uh, their economic model, right? So all of these pretty much are, are, are neutral, anti-spam transaction fees, okay, maybe this is positive. Having that is, is positive because if you don't have it at all, then maybe it's too jammed, I can't even send my money. Coin utility, um, it doesn't, for me, it just, it's a medium, right? Really, I just want to send another person 100,000 USD. Uh, limited block space, this is negative. Again, this is the big block, small block conversation, right? So this one will make transaction fees more expensive. So as the result, and then uh, what we're seeing is Bitcoin is basically losing to its competitors as a payment network solution, right? So in fact, USDTs are taking over, right? Or stable coins are taking over as the peer, -peer network, right? Uh, the reason is it actually satisfies people's needs, right? So especially low volatility is very, very important. Okay, now let's look at store value network. Uh, users care about, now I care about security, right? So if I uh, leave, 
100 bitcoins to, you know, to, to store, maybe leave it to my son. Yeah, I want to make sure it's secure. It's not going to break down in, you know, anytime soon. And liquidity, important, right? So this is when I go in and go out at the store value network. Censorship is now, all of a sudden, this is important, right? So this is why land is, real estate could be a bad uh, store of value because it's very much up to government regime to take away my land ownership, right? So there's a revolution that my land is lost. So similarly here, I want to make sure it's central resistant. Nobody can take it away. Sustainability, this is important. So people don't care about its fees. Okay, so now let's look at examine Bitcoin's crypto design in this lens. Now, cap supply, all of a sudden, very, very positive, right? Um, because it gives scarcity and then therefore that, you know, give people expectation that the value will be sustainable, right? Uh, they're not going to be get infinitely diluted. Geomarif increased issuance. This is positive because it incentivizes community to uh, start recognize Bitcoin to store of value. Fixed block reward when it's halving and then mining competition in native currency. Those two are very, not only important, but necessary, right? So think about this. These two parameters together allows the Bitcoin protocol to automatically provision security when the asset is secures, uh, price goes up and down, right? So if BTC price goes up 10 times or 100 times, the network will automatically have 10 times or 100 times the security. That's because the miners are paid with the native currency and then the miners' payments are also stable, right? Within four years of time. Right, so this is a very, very important uh, parameter. Again, this doesn't matter for peer-to-peer -peer -peer network, um, but this is very important for SOE. So instead of fees, positive, and this time, coin utility, this is necessary. Why is it necessary? Because now the Bitcoin native currency functions as an asset instead of media exchange. And when you function as an asset, right, so if also functions as value hatcher because the demand for stored value will put demand to hold your cryptocurrency, not to use, not to transact, but to hold. And that's a fundamental difference. And then limited block space, also positive. This is for central resistance, right? So you can see almost everything, every design in Bitcoin's cryptocurrency model aligns its positioning at the SOV network. Um, so uh, now Bitcoin does have an issue, which we call continuity issue in Bitcoin, because uh, fundamentally, Bitcoin is going to have a uh, sort of um, inflection point, which is when issuance stops. When issuance stops, sometimes it will happen. So when that happens, two of the necessary parameters, what we believe in here, will no longer be there, which is number three and number four, right? So when Bitcoin issuance stops, you no longer have fixed block reward when it's halving. It's based on transaction fees, right? There's no block reward anymore, no fixed blocks, no fixed Bitcoins, every block. There's also, um, well, there's still complexity in native currency, but I guess, you know, the, the, the third one is not, does not hold anymore. And that introduces tremendous risk for Bitcoin as SOV. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but just to talk about what we believe Bitcoin's cryptonomics is not perfect, um, there is some continuity issue with the crypto economic model with the Bitcoin. Okay, so where we're going with this, right? So we kind of go through Bitcoin's, you know, media exchange, store value approach. But I want to show you, even the same cryptonomic design, it's very much necessary to drive the project towards one direction or the other, right? In other words, if your cryptonomic design fits the goal of your users, right, your users' objectives, then you will grow like a Bitcoin SOV model. Basically, you don't have any challenger at all. Nobody competes, no competitors. But if you don't have it, if your crypto economic model does not fit your user's goals or user's objective, what they prioritize that's important, then you, know, you will lose in that battle. Therefore, your token will lose value and then it will come back as a difficult to use something not of value to incentivize participants. Okay, so, uh, we want to look at the crypto token network effects, right? So uh, this is from Chris Dixon. Uh, you can follow the link. So the idea is basically, you know, the token network effect, you know, what we have new over traditional network effect is we can have tokens to bootstrap the network effect to help come over this, um, this uh, bootstrapping portion of this adoption curve. 
Um, now, you know, that is a very, you know, most people know about that topic, but what we argue is the network, network effects are not enough, right? Uh, <laughs> not be enough, sorry. So <laughs> as a payment network, uh, again, use the same example, right? So Bitcoin, as a payment network, the network effects in exchanges, wallets, users, and merchants, these adoptions. However, these can be forked or utilized by, for example, Omni USDT, right? So, I mean, nowadays, I mean, most people just pay each other with Omni USDT or US um, or ER, uh, ERC twenty USDT, basically, instead of using the Bitcoin, because Bitcoin's exchange wallet user merchants. If you start, if you support Bitcoin, then you support this as well, right? Um, so it can be directly inherited. Therefore, you just lose the necessary moat. You, you lose your moat. When you lose your moat, you're going to be all competed. Okay. Now, uh, Bitcoin's network as an SOV. Uh, so if we map it out, it looks like this, right? So, uh, and then this is where the difference is. So when you have higher Bitcoin price, if you're going left, right? So that means the compensation, because you pay miners with the BTC, fixed amount of BTC per block. If Bitcoin price goes higher, that means miner income will go up, right? That means they can afford to give you more hash power, right? So higher security, and then higher security makes a better SOV network. If it's a better SOV network, when somebody's facing the choice, what do I want to put my SOV money into Bitcoin or Litecoin or Dogecoin, then it's no brainer, I'm gonna put in Bitcoin, right? Because it be become much better if the price is higher because it's more secure. Now, similarly, if you go right, and then more user demand make higher Bitcoin price, right? So if you go right, higher Bitcoin price makes higher liquidity, and then, right, so when your market cap is larger, then it's easier for me to come in and out, which is also a benefit for SOV users, right? If I wanna save $10 million into some network, I, I can't really use Dogecoin because it will just, you know, mess up the price. Um, there's not even liquidity, but Bitcoin has the most liquidity. Therefore, higher BTC price also makes it's more liquid, right? So it makes a uh, better SOV network and will generate more user demand and go back to the BTC price, right? So you can see the difference of Bitcoin's network effect uh, is because uh, it has this BTC token price as part of the now as part of the network effect, and that you know we believe is a very important um, uh, component, right? So we call this flywheel economics, flywheel crypto economics. So basically, you want to use your growing capitalization as the critical, as part of the critical network effect. And if you do that, you can grow and sustain project competitive advantage, and capture value to the token and uphold the long-term security of the of, of the protocol. So this, we believe, it's the most important when we talk on macro macro crypto economics uh, design. And you know, simply, uh, again, if we generalize this a little bit simply, it basically means higher token price leads to higher network utility, which leads back to higher token price, right? Um, okay. Now, how do you, okay, so if you can, if you're with me so far, then you know, how do we design our own flywheel, right? So, um, and, and this is sort of a step that we identified and then, um, uh, so first of all, the first thing you want to do, and this is what we believe when we talk to crypto economic designers, we often find that uh, people don't know where to start, right? People just say, okay, first we're going to have a hard cap. That's it. And then we're going to do linear issuance. And then we're going to, you know, we're going to stake because why not? Because it helps with the price, right? So it, it feels like a very scattered process. And then, you know, if we can see this flywheel crypto economics uh, uh, process, and so what we believe is to start with who brings external value to the protocol, right? So this is, you can think about this as like your network's revenue, if you will, right, from the outside. And then you want to design your token utility such that, again, you want it to be aligned with this, this uh, flywheel economics model so that higher token price can be used to grow the network. So, <laughs> so how can it be used, right? So uh, capitalization, the liquidity, if that can be a advantage, then you should, you know, I think you find a gold mine there. It's, it's very, very effective. Uh, you can use it to subsidize to the two sides. You can use it to subsidize service providers that generate growth, or you can subsidize users so that it lower the transaction fee, lower their cost. So either generate more, uh, you know, intrinsic value, or you always make sure you're the cheapest in the space, right? And then, uh, 
either way, if your capitalization is the biggest, you have this advantage that you can always run faster and then you can grow your network's intrinsic value faster than your copycats, your competitors. Uh, and then finally, make sure your token captures ecosystem value, um, which means I think we'll talk about this, right? Demand for the network generates demand to hold the native token, right? So this is sort of the whole flywheel economics model and then make sure you have continuity, make sure it doesn't suddenly change at some point. So you need to think about your issuance curve and think about you know, how, um, you know, if you do have hard cap, then you have a mechanism in space, in place to, to deal with it. Okay, so I'm gonna go through some examples, uh, a project with flywheel. And um, so for example, you can argue that MakerDAO has a flywheel, right? So higher MKR price, make it that you have a better volatility insurance. So MKR price, MKR's capitalization can be viewed as uh, volatility insurance, right? So if a better volatility insurance, that actually makes you a better stable coin, right? And that will give more user demand, and then more user demand means, you know, more DAI, and then more take out, effectively people are taking out loans, and that means more MKR burn. So the MKR burn means value, gen value the capture, right? So this is how you capture back value into your native token, which drive up maker price. So you have this positive feedback loop or positive network effect with your price as part of this network effect, right? So again, just to, to, to emphasize, we believe this is the most powerful flywheel crypto economics. Um, and why it's important, again, because, just to go back a little bit, right? So because everybody can copy you, everybody can launch, everybody can get your markets, but there are two things that people can't copy. They can't copy your market capitalization. And then, you know, for like POW projects, they can't copy your hash power, right? So you wanna focus on growing things that people cannot copy, right? To utilize those to grow your, your market. Um, okay, now obviously this wouldn't be complete without talking about our flywheel. Right, so again, so we are a multi-asset store value network, right? So our native token is CKB. So CK bytes, so CK bytes just means that it's a, a claim to the global state, right? So we want to be the sort of the, uh, the value storage. So if Bitcoin is monetary store value, store monetary value, because Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency, we want to be the platform that stores asset value, right? So non-monetary value, any sort of tokens and you know tokenized assets in the real world or you know digital native assets, uh, we want to be the platform that store those. So the uh, again, it's also a SOV focused flywheel, so that's very similar to Bitcoin. Um, that higher CKB price, the miner will pay more for security, and then if you're more secure, you are actually a better sort of you can think about you're a better bank vault vault for valuables, right? So you can support more money to attract POW miner hash rate. That makes you more secure, and then it's a better store of assets. So people are more willing to deposit their valuable assets here instead of elsewhere. And then that will generate more demand for state storage, and then we'll go back to higher CKB price. Again, uh, I recommend you guys to read our crypto paper. There's a link in the end. Um, and on the right side, higher CKB price also means higher settlement efficiency, right? So CKB, our layer one protocol is not designed as a high TPS protocol, right? So we rely on layer two to do the computation or transactions. And then layer one is more of a settlement platform. So it, when you have CKB price much higher, that means every, say we have a block every you know, 15 seconds, then every 15 seconds, the economic value to revert that block or settlement ability is gonna be higher. So that makes a better settlement platform. And that make it a better layer one for layer two and then that will generate more demand for state storage. Um, so again, you know, you can please, you know, to uh, go to our website, you can learn about the uh, nervous. But, okay, so we do recognize that not every project has a flywheel, and then, so what are the things that don't have flywheel, right? So the simple way to think about this, okay, token price appreciation does not really increase your user's preference over this network or the other, right? So just token price being higher does not help this network being more attractive. I will argue all payment networks, right? So they don't have flywheel. And then uh, TPS smart contract networks, if the token price is higher, that doesn't really make the network better, right? Um, it, because you know people want to be able to do transactions 
so you know the the amount of gas you use is not determined by, for example, ETH price, but it's dependent by congestion of the network, right? So this this is neutral. This is not negative, but it's neutral. Okay, so when you are designing a project, uh, crypto, crypto economics for a project, and you feel like, oh, there's no flywheel, right? Then at least you want to make sure that you design critical network effects and most somewhere else. There has to be, uh, it has to be come from somewhere else, right? So for, for example, uh, Ethereum in its developer community, right? So that in itself can be, that in itself is a network effect and it's also a moat. For other pro for other high TPS smart contract platforms, right? So, but that's not in its token price or what we call flywheel economics loop uh, feedback loop. Also, Ethereum is a DeFi ecosystem, right? So, obviously, you know, the more sort of this is kind of similar to the co developer community. The more DeFi projects you have, then you tend to attract more DeFi projects. So, if you don't have flywheel, make sure you have modes or network effects somewhere else, right? Otherwise, copycats are going to compete away value by bootstrap subsidy, right? So your competitors is going to bootstrap their network and provide subsidy. And um, so, for example, better payment network chains, there are a ton of them we don't even remember. There's so many Bitcoin forks that just die away. There's a reason for that. And I want to kind of also think about like a bet dice, right? So there are many of this type of projects last year, I think, basically, just, you know, some something as mining, right? So bet dice is like playing, playing dice as mining. So you play games, depending on how many games you play, you, you will receive network native token, right? So the more you play, you get more token. So it's like game playing as mining, in a way. The problem with that is Bad Dice is a player versus house game, right? You play with the computer, which means there's no network effect. Sure, you, you can use your token to bootstrap the marketing of your project. So more people know about, oh, there's a thing here, maybe I should come here and maybe do some mining to you know, get some value here, but there's no inherent network effect outside of your flywheel, right? Because I'm just playing with the computer, the network, and there's a, another similar app. They can also, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have this. If it's a poker game, it will be different because, you know, more poker players online will increase the value of the poker network itself, right? So this is what I'm talking about with no flywheel. Make sure you have network effects and modes somewhere else. Um, finally, you want to avoid crypto economic projects that wear down growth. So this is, you can think about this like reverse flywheel, right? Uh, pretty much all staking to earn transaction fee model has the reverse flywheel effect. Why is that, right? So, uh, you know, if we assume that the demand to this type of use case is constant, it's the same, right? This, this is your discounted cash flow to the network is you know, you demand to the market, it's, it, it's the same. Then if your price goes higher, that means to stake, you have to stake more capital to make the same yield in terms of capture the discounted cash flow, right? So this makes you the opposite of flywheel, right? So more, the higher the price is, make your project worse from the point of view of your participants, especially you ask them to provide a critical service, right? So if you want your stakers to also, you know, do some work, and this is called, this is known as the work token model. If you want a participant to do some work to be able to receive this kind of cash flow, then if you have a higher token price, it's actually worse for them. They would rather go to somewhere cheaper and then earn more um, higher yield for their capital, right? And then, you know, you can argue that pure governance tokens may also have this issue, right? So without value underpinning, if it's just the, the you know, a way to vote, then higher market capitalization with the incentive of forking. Of course I want to fork, this is, this is succeeding. And then I'm not agree with the core team on something, then I'm, gonna f I'm more likely to fork it than not, right? If it is a lower valued um, capital uh, governance token, then yeah, I have better use of my time, right? So if it's higher to token, yeah, in my opinion, I should make it worse. So again, if you think about the projects here we mentioned he today, with flywheel economics, no, none of these projects has any competitor, zero. They're almost one of its own type in their use cases, and almost everybody else has competitors. And there's a reason for that. We believe this is a very, very powerful way to design your crypto economics. Uh, okay, last one, auction-based bear to entry token model. Um, this is a little bit kind of, you know, indirect, but there are 
project where you know new, for example, right, like cross-chain networks. If you cross-chain network, the critical network effect is in the number of chains in this network, right? To have a multi-chain cross-chain network, the more chains you have, then the more value a, a, a new entrant of the network will receive. But then if you have to have them bid to enter the network, that means the capital cost to join the network will actually increase. Right? So as your token price goes up, or goes up then it, it actually lowers your network's um, the value, everything else being the equal. Um, Okay, conclusion effect, uh, remarks. Um, so uh, it's a very new and challenging discipline and we need to learn from experience. So anyway, so we just wanted to share what we learned um, and uh, we think it's an interesting concept and a new experiment. Um, yeah, so in the end, I just wanna put, you know, feel free to check out our economic model and then welcome any questions. Hey, um, when you talked about um, staking for transaction fees um, being bad for the for the network itself, does that include staking rewards like a like a block reward like ETH two will have, or is that just you? Are you separating those two? Thanks. Thank you. Hello. Oh, okay. So. When you think about uh, designing your cryptonomics, the first thing you want to focus on is value come from external of the network, the protocol. They, that's where your value and your opinion comes from. You can't just use issuance and assume issuance will automatically increase the value, right? So in other words, uh, it's really the transaction fees that represent the flow of value from outside to the inside. You want to that's where that's the value you want to capture, right? So just block issuance um, that doesn't represent it's block issuance represent value transfer. It's a value transfer from non-staker to stakers, right? Because everything else being the same, the one second after you issue more block rewards, the network value cannot increase just that one second, right? So it really represents that you know the people that don't stake will be diluted, and the people that do stake will either catch up with their inflation or even overly compensate it. So it represents a value transfer, not a value, not an income or revenue to the entire network. Therefore, when you consider, um, the, we call it flyway economics, right? You need to think about, you know, the, the flow of outside value into the network and at discount cash flow, for example, if it's about revenue, um, and then how that comes into, get distributed into the stakers. Um, and the effect of token price uh, to influence that. So, yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah, please. So, uh, my understanding of what you described in the uh, the flywheel economics is that it sounds like there's basically two ways in which you can capture value. One is, for instance, if you have the social network effect where more users using the application inherently makes the application more useful, for instance, like a social network. So in this case, growth is directly captured by design, by application design in application value, which will make your token value hopefully go up. And I think if I understand what you're saying, right, the other way is that where you design the token economy so that more users using your application increases token value, which somehow makes the network utility more, for instance, by, by providing more security, by when the mining, when the token utility goes up in terms of Bitcoin usage. So is that, is that correct? Yeah. There's two ways that I think this can basically be. Yeah, uh, so the, uh, I think for flywheel economics, the most important um, uh, sort of this linkage, right, the step is that you want to make sure the token price increase can lead to, just that by itself can lead to the increase, the value of the network, or make it more attractive to your users. Again, you know, to answer that question, it really comes down to you have to understand what the users needs. Uh, in the beginning, I talk about Bitcoin as SOV or as media exchange, very different preferences. They need different things, right? So, um, you know, you want to make sure that 
everybody can push up their network with issuance, right? You want to make sure your issuance actually goes to do something meaningful, right? That's a way to, to think about this. Like, for example, to increase your liquidity for most exchange or exchange, you know, uh, you know, Binance, Huobi, or, you know, you can argue liquidity is their competitive advantage. Then you want to use your token issuance to subsidize that, right? For um, SOV type of networks like Bitcoin, I would argue security or number of miner support, it's number one competitive advantage. You can copy, you can, you can copy the, you know, Nakamoto consensus, but you can't copy the miners overnight, right? So then use your capitalization or high value price to subsidize that so that you grow faster and faster and then your copycats can chase you, right? So that's kind of the, 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 the gist of, of this. And then I feel that's the most powerful thing just because you can, with crypto networks, you can copy everything. You can fork, you can get everything, all the data, everybody's balance and everything, right? You can airdrop to everybody with a token, but you cannot copy capitalization of a network, right? Otherwise, we won't see coin market cap today. It will be always changing. People just forking around. Uh, so you cannot cop automatically copy capitalization, which means you need to use that to your advantage to grow faster and faster. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much, All Kevin. Right. One more round of applause for Kevin, please. Thank you.